Okay, let's start. Um, my name is Stefan Jacmet and I'm the Director of Policy at the International Catholic Migration Commission. On behalf of the five co-organizers, ACT Alliance, Caritas Internationalis, the Platform on Disaster Displacement, Secours Catholique Caritas France, and my own organization, ICMC, I would like to wel welcome you all and to express our gratitude that you are ready to spend the time with us to discuss this very important topic. A little bit later, uh, I will be uh, introducing the subject as well as introducing mainly the, the panelists, as well as maybe uh, give you some um, housekeeping um, instructions. But before that, I would like to uh, welcome Ambassador Francois Ribasso, the permanent representative of France to the UN in Geneva, and the chair of the platform on disaster displacement. And it is in that capacity that he will make some introductory remarks. So Ambassador, you have the floor. Merci, cher Stéphane. Thank you, dear Stéphane. Ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, dear friends, uh, every protocol observed. I would like to welcome all of you to this side event. I can see there are a number of attendants and that's great. It's encouraging to see states and civil society stakeholders come together virtually to discuss human rights in disaster and climate change context, while the Human Rights Council itself is in its 45th session. The impacts of climate change and increasing frequency of disasters are more and more felt around the world. It is important we discuss the human rights protection challenges for those displaced in this context. Also in the time of COVID-19, which is currently obtaining most of states' attention and disturbing most of our mechanisms to protect the most, the more vulnerable. I'm speaking today, as you said, dear Stefan, in my capacity as the chair of the platform on disaster displacement, what we call usually the PDD, uh, a terrible acronym. The PDD is a state-led initiative working towards better protection of persons displaced across borders in the context of disasters and climate change. We are very pleased that our vice chair, Fiji, is represented today on this panel. Fiji is very much affected by climate change and is an encouraging example that much can be done to adapt to it, to prepare to it, to respond to its negative impact. We also know that Fiji shows global leadership on climate action. For example, Fiji had the presidency of a climate change conference in 2017, the COP23. The protection of human rights of persons at risk of displacement or displaced across borders in the context of disasters and climate change is an important focus for the PDD. This platform was established in 2016 to follow up on the work on the so-called Nansen Initiative, uh, one of the Nansen Initiatives, there are more than one, and to support states and other stakeholders to implement the recommendation of a Nansen Initiative Protection Agenda which was endorsed by more than 100 states in October 2015. Yesterday, if I may, uh, I, had a, I hosted a very interesting meeting with the participation of various ambassadors and uh, first and foremost with the participation of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Madame Michelle Bachelet. Very interesting. We all realized during this event that how much powerful the instrument of human rights could be in regards of addressing protection of people displaced due to disaster. According to High Commissioner Bachelet, instead of establishing new instruments, international community could uh, smartly use better existing instruments like uh, the human rights instrument, the GCM, uh, the two compact GCM and GCR, the Paris agreements and I framework also, and focusing more on their implementation, strengthening partnerships, between UN agencies across silos, focusing on action as well as on prevention, and above all, looking for political commitment from states. This is actually what we are trying to do in the PDD, and we feel therefore this analysis fully supports and uh, encourages our strategy. One of the priorities for France during our chairmanship is to better focus on engaging states and other stakeholders on the issue of disaster displacement. And we welcome, dear Stefan, your initiative and this event as an avenue for engagement with both civil society and states. 
particularly in civil society states like those you, uh, which are represented here today and that I see represented here today. Since then, one of the priorities of France during our chairmanship has been to better focus on engaging states and other st stakeholders on the issue of disaster displacement. Uh, this event is an avenue for engaging with both civil society and states. And global policy instruments and processes have also highlighted the relevance of our work, the importance of human rights protection in this context. As you know, in 2017, Resolution 35-20 of the Human Rights Council called for the protection of the human rights of those displaced across borders in the context of adverse impacts of climate change, including through climate change adaptation and mitigation policies. And, Monday, and we have mandated the, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights to undertake research addressing human rights, protection gaps, in the context of migration and displacement of persons across international borders, when these displacements result from the sudden onset and slow onset adverse effect on, of climate change. To this end, PDD and the High Commissioner Office have commissioned joint research on the slow onset effects of climate change and human rights protection for cross-border mi migrants. We are very pleased that the author of this study, Lauren Nishimura, is with us and will today elaborate on the findings. Very instructive, I'm sure. I know. The Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration makes specific commitments to protect, respect and fulfill the human rights of migrants. And the Paris Agreement acknowledges that parties to the agreement shall respect, promote and consider their respective obligations on human rights when taking action to address climate change. And the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction also emphasizes that managing the risk of disasters should aim at protecting persons while promoting and promoting all human rights, including the human rights of those displaced in climate change and disaster contexts. In this wider context, it is imperative that the international community come together among states, UN, civil society actors to discuss what we can do in the context of disasters and climate change for human rights protection, what it means in practice, in concrete terms. We stand ready to work with states and other stakeholders, both as France and as chair of the PDD, uh, to enhance the use of international human rights law in this context. We believe it is time to explore opportunities for harmonizing existing approaches to the protection of disaster displaced persons at regional and at sub-regional levels, in particular in the geographic regions presented here today, both Pacific and Sahel. So let's hear from the experiences, see what lessons we can learn. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the, this organization. Congratulations. I look forward for the presentation and discussion to be extremely productive. Thank you, dear Stefan. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for being uh, so clear and being so focused. I think it will really be a big help to guide us in our discussion uh, today. So thanks, thanks, thanks again. So now, uh, maybe just three points regarding the the webinar itself. So first to inform you that the webinar is being recorded and you will have access. We will send you the link to the recording later on. Uh, secondly, um, the second part of the webinar is in the form of uh, question from your part and answers from the, the panelists. So you can start uh, putting your question in the chat box, the, the, there is a, an icon called chat at the, the bottom of your screen uh, in the, the middle. So you can just click there and put your uh, question. And then um, the, thirdly, we have asked uh, each of the panelists to speak for about eight minutes to really uh, summarize their, um, their findings and their points and just to make sure that there is indeed room for a dialogue and um, a discussion. So uh, now the, the webinar itself and the content and the, the panelists. So uh, the title of the webinar is Cross-Border Human Mobility and Human Rights in the Context of Disasters, Climate Change and Environmental Degradation. The title means that we have three main uh, focuses which will be framing the, the discussion. 
The first one indeed is that we will be talking about disasters, climate change and environmental degradation, but with a specific focus on slow onset events. The second focus is um, human mobility and in particular cross-border human mobility. We all know that uh, in the context of uh, displacement for people uh, being displaced for climate related reasons, most of the people, the vast majority of the people remain in their country of origin. But there is a growing phenomenon of people uh, um, crossing an international border for two reasons, because the number of people being displaced for clim climate related reasons grow exponentially. And secondly, because the capacity of um, country of origin already impacted by, for example, climate change becomes more and more limited as the number grow. So we can say that it's very topical to discuss the issue of cross-border mobility. And finally, the final angle, the final focus will be human rights, because we are organizing this event as a sideline event of the 45th session of the Human Rights Council. We believe that the issue itself, but the people being displaced, needs to have a right-based answer. We cannot leave them in a limbo. We need to ensure that they have a status, they have access to rights and uh, services. So to discuss that, we have um, three um, panelists. Our first panelist is Lauren Nishimura. She's a lawyer and a PhD candidate at Oxford University, whose research focuses on climate change and migration. She's the author of the uh, study commissioned by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Platform on Disaster Development uh, called the slow onset effects of climate change and human rights protection for cross-border migrants. Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so thank you, Stefan, for the introduction. Um, and first, I want to thank PDD and OHCHR for the opportunity to undertake the study that I'm going to discuss today and to thank the organizers for this important event. Um, I also want to apologize in advance if I have to pause to catch my breath. Um, I'm seven months pregnant right now, so please bear with me. Um, okay, so I was asked to introduce slow onset events and the main findings of the study. So I think the best way to do this is to frame my remarks to cover two questions. The first is, what are slow onset events or disasters and how do they contribute to mobility? And the second, why are there gaps in legal protection and what role can human rights play in addressing these gaps? And then I'm gonna conclude with a few points about the importance of international cooperation. So I'll do my best to answer these questions in the time I have today by drawing on the study. So overall, the objective of the study was to analyze several key issues. The first was to understand the risks to human rights that slow onset disasters pose then to identify gaps in international legal protection for people who will cross borders in this context. And then finally, to explore ways that certain legal obligations and policy solutions can fill these gaps um, with a particular emphasis on the role of human rights-based approaches. In the process, it used four case studies focusing on South Asia, the Pacific Island States, Sahel countries, and Central America to illustrate the risks to rights and the challenges posed by slow onset events across different contexts. So from the analysis of the study, I think we can answer the first question, which was again, what are the slow, what are slow onset events and how do they contribute to, mo to mobility? Um, as most of us know, climate impacts are generally characterized by the length of time that the adverse effects occur. So for slow onset events, this, this generally means a uh, gradual, gradual change over a period of weeks, months, and years. And this is in contrast to sudden onset events that are discrete. Uh, slow onset events include things like sea level rise, desertification, and environmental degradation. Because of their prolonged nature, slow onset events are often associated with more voluntary forms of movement. Uh, 
even if this doesn't reflect the reality of how human mobility works, this is important uh, because of the way international protection frameworks work, uh, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, their gradual impacts also add an element of foreseeability, which allows for a, a wide range of actions to be taken in advance. Second, slow onset events do not operate in isolation. They will occur in a context uh, with conditions that contribute to vulnerability and in turn to whether a person moves. Slow onset events will often interact with other climate Im impacts as well. Um, so for example, sea level rise often occurs alongside storm surges. Um, both of these contribute to erosion and flooding and ultimately make it difficult for a person to, to, just, to stay in a place. Um, third, they contribute to mobility in a variety of ways. It's clear that whether directly, but more often indirectly, they are a driver of mobility. And then this can come in the form of displacement, it can be migration in search of new opportunities or a new home. It can be temporary, but it's more likely to become permanent as climate impacts worsen. And it will occur both internally and across borders. And importantly, some of these events might also render some people unable to move. This is due to the multitude of risks that climate impacts pose to human rights, uh, which is discussed in greater detail in the study. Um, but this includes the rights to life, to food, to water, health, and housing. Um, from the case studies, it's also clear that there are specific places that will be more vulnerable than others. And, and that due to an interaction with a given context, certain individuals and groups will also be particularly vulnerable in these places. So this can include people on the margins already, um, in particular children, women in vulnerable situations, persons with disabilities, and indigenous peoples. Together, the case studies can help us predict based on historical and existing patterns of movement and mobility where people may move in the future. Okay, on to the second question, which was why are there gaps in legal protection and what role can human rights play in addressing these gaps? The study details some instances where people will qualify for protection based on current legal frameworks. So for example, through refugee status uh, or for not or, or using non-refoulement principles, but most often people who move in the, in the context of slow onset disasters do not qualify. Uh, there are several reasons for these gaps. The first is the nature of these frameworks, uh, which tend to focus on forced movement and displacement. And as I noted, uh, it's often thought that slow onset events trigger more voluntary forms of movement, even if this is not the reality. Um, second, protection is often granted based on specific criteria and via a, a retroactive status determination. Um, these determinations usually happen only after people have moved or if they've crossed a border. Um, and most people who move, as I've said, due to slow onset disasters do not fit neatly into any of these current status-based criteria. Um, the third reason is uh, just a general lack of human rights-based approaches currently applied to migrants and to cross-border mobility. Um, this is due in part to the fact that there's no general right to enter or to stay in another country. Um, also in light of the barriers to international mobility that, that currently push people into irregular and, and precarious migration. Um, and then these barriers in turn exacerbate or create further vulnerabilities for people on the move. However, as the study concludes and as we're focusing on today, um, there's both a need and great potential for human rights based approaches to fill these gaps in protection. So both because of the foreseeability of these risks and because of human rights obligations, states are required to take certain proactive and preventive measures. So for example, they are obligated to address the known factors that contribute to vulnerability and risks to rights. This includes both environmental factors like degradation and other slow onset events, um, and also societal factors like the socioeconomic and political conditions at a given context. Um, these conditions are also part of states core human rights obligations to provide essential resources like access to food, water, health, and housing. Together, these obligations mean that first, you don't have to parcel out causes of vulnerability, but instead states are obligated to address all of the drivers of mobility. Second, that all states have these duties. And third, international assistance is required when a state has difficulty addressing these conditions or providing basic resources. Um, Human rights is also uh, applicable regardless of migration status, which makes them a really powerful tool for migrants uh, in the context of climate change. They apply before, during, and after movement. Uh, they strengthen duties to mitigate, which alone will reduce displacement risk significantly. Um, and they create obligations to create 
uh, to take certain anticipatory measures that build resilience and that allow people to adapt. Um, these measures, for example, can enable people to stay in a place as long as possible. Uh, they can allow for migration as adaptation, which can reduce displacement. Um, they can lead to facilitating planned relocation um, or responses to displacement if it occurs. Such an approach also crucially um, provides rights to information, uh, meaningful consequences, consultation and participation um, that allow people to be agents in decision making that affects them. And then finally, and more generally, how we frame mobility in this context matters. So a focus on national security alone, for example, continues to contribute to the barriers to international mobility. But a human rights based approach uh, and an emphasis on the potential positive role that the migration can play puts people and their rights at the center, which often leads to better outcome for migrants. So uh, finally, uh, on international cooperation, like human rights-based approaches, um, it'll be vital to help determine the conditions under which people move in the future. Cooperation and assistance are obligations that are set out in human rights law. They're also in the crime, climate agreements. They're needed to provide rights-based approaches to climate action across contexts, um, to find solutions that reduce migration barriers and provide safe pathways uh, for cross-border movement. And they're also necessary to ensure that people are treated without discrimination um, on the basis of equality and with dignity and respect so that migrants have equal access, uh, for example, to basic necessities, to resources, services, and, and to remedies. Um, such cooperation also helps to make linkages not only between state, local, and international actors, but across international organizations and processes to ensure concerted, coordinated efforts um, to keep up this discourse and momentum on the issue, um, to shift the focus to the risks that, that are posed by salons at events and enable action before the worst impacts occur. And then finally, to keep people and their rights central in climate action, which is urgently needed now. Um, so with that, I close my presentation and I look forward to further questions and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Lauren, and uh, thank you for uh, organizing your presentation around these uh, two questions, because I think that was very helpful because it also made the issues uh, clearer, in particular, the, the whole issue of uh, access to status, the limitations, but also the opportunities. So thanks a lot. So my uh, next uh, speaker, is uh, Ambassador Nazat Shamim Khan. Uh, she is the permanent representative of Fiji to the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. Fiji is currently the, the vice chair of the Platform on Disaster Development. Ambassador Khan was last year a vice president of the Human Rights Council and was part of the Fiji's COP23 presidency team. For people who are not familiar with COP23, it was the 2017 United Nations Climate Change Conference. So Ambassador, it's a pleasure and an honor to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chair, and thank you for this very important event. Um, thank you to the organizers of the event, um, and I look forward in particular to the discussions that we will have from the floor. The issue of uh, displacement in the Pacific is one which is fraught with both uh, emotion and concern for the degree of alienation that many Pacific Islanders feel will result as a result of uh, the environmental degradation. In many countries in the Pacific, the land which is considered to be land protected for people, for communities, because of this ancestral link with the land, that is in itself uh, a threat because of rising sea levels. But even before the sea levels um, are taken into account, the salination of fresh water supplies and the degradation of land which is set aside for the growing of food. So, it's been a difficult conversation in the Pacific. It's been easier to talk about displacement within national borders, and that is already happening in many of our countries in the Pacific, where we are forced to move communities from the outlying islands, for instance, or from coastal regions to higher ground because of the degradation of the environment 
and because of king tides and king tides and uh, rising sea levels but also because a discussion about displacement within borders is a less sensitive topic much more sensitive is the discussion about cross border displacement if the rising sea levels and environmental degradation if these are not stopped in their tracks and if this is then uh, leading to the loss of sovereignty and of islands altogether in the Pacific. This is a very difficult and sensitive subject because I would say most Pacific Islanders are not prepared to accept that they may have to move. And it is for that reason that we haven't really had a regional conversation about this in the Pacific. It's because it's such a difficult subject. However, in addition to these uh, barriers to a discussion, in addition to those is a concern that um, when people do move, they will lose their cultures. So this fear of the loss of cultural autonomy is something in the central of a conversation in the Pacific. In, within our countries, when we talk about displacement from one part uh, of, of the country to another, and now I speak specifically of Fiji, what makes it very difficult also to have this conversation is the lack of data. We may not always be able to identify those who are most affected by displacement within our countries. And so this, the whole idea of communal ownership of land and about communal responsibility for individuals has been a barrier to uh, identifying individuals who might be disproportionately affected. Also, um, a barrier to this conversation is the fact that uh, for sudden onset disasters, and I know that this uh, event is not uh, specifically about sudden onset disasters, but it is also um, a relevant consideration that for sudden onset disasters, when as a result of a hurricane or a cyclone, we are forced to evacuate people into, for instance, evacuation centers converted from schools, it is also a, a real barrier to um, ensure that the, the community is safely able to move back uh, to where it was and that uh, rights to adequate housing and sanitation and water can be guaranteed in this movement back. So these are some of the difficult issues in the Pacific in relation to displacement, both internally and cross-border. And it's very important, I think, that countries identify vulnerability assessments as ways of doing this effectively within our countries and also ensuring that community decisions are informed by science. So Fiji has a project at present uh, with UNICET, um, and uh, this is about satellite technology assisting our communities to work towards really resilience. I'm now going to move on to some of the initiatives that we have adopted nationally and regionally to really address this very difficult conversation. At the national level, we've accepted that if we are going to work on displacement within our borders, and we're going to do it in a way which integrates human rights and dignity, and these are rights guaranteed by our constitution, then we must have guidelines which are clear, which are transparent, and which everybody knows about before we can address this issue. And central to the, to the guidelines, and in Fiji they're called the planned relocation guidelines, central to these guidelines is that ultimately the decision as to whether or not a community should move should be the community's. Where the community is going to move should be the community's decision. And the conditions to which the community is moving should be a decision in which the community has a central role. So community participation and the involvement of people must be part of the process, but they must also be very relevant to the substance of this movement. So when we are moving people to higher ground, for instance, this is a process by which we need to guarantee rights, rights to adequate housing, proper lighting, electricity, their access to schools, to, to, to um, medical centers. These are issues of substance, which must be guaranteed in the process. So a national initiative, which we have adopted and we launched at a previous COP, was that we would have relocation guidelines. They have been launched and Fiji is following them. And they put people at the center of this conversation. Secondly, it's very important that those who are customarily left behind 
should be part of this conversation. I myself belong to a culture where women have not always been in the room when decisions are made. And to ensure that women and children, those with disabilities, persons from the LGBT community, that all of them are part of this decision-making process is really, has really been a leap in attitudinal approaches in Fiji. So ensuring that they are involved in this is part of the relocation guidelines. And this has had a transformative effect on Fijian society. So when we talk about opportunities in this process, and we have so much time, much more time than a sudden disaster, to plan this in an orderly and dignified way. In planning this, we must remember that this is also a transformative process, that perhaps our communities will never look the same again, because suddenly those who have not traditionally had a voice have a voice. And not only do they have a voice, they are empowered through this process. They are the ones who are making the decisions. An example is the solar mamas. We have a, 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 an agreement with the, um, with the Indian government where women from our communities are taught how to install solar power into villages, into homes in the villages. So when a community is moving, consulting these women to ensure that everyone has not only power, but has power which is climate friendly, this process has really empowered the women in the villages. This is an important process. I now move on very quickly, and I know the time is limited, very quickly to regional initiatives. The PDD, the IOM, OHCHR, and a number of other development partners are working with Pacific Island countries now to start a regional conversation about whether we need a framework for mobility in the Pacific. This is a community, as I've said, which does not really want to talk about the alienation of land and people. But it is a conversation that is increasingly becoming necessary as we face this reality within our borders. The important role of PDD and IOM, OHCHR in the Pacific is to start this conversation, to work towards a project and a framework for the Pacific where we can really consider how we're going to do this, how we put human rights and dignity in the center of this conversation, and how we ensure we do this in a sensitive, inclusive, and participatory way. And as I've said, a transformative way. I don't think that we will, any of us will ever be the same again once we have approached this uh, in this human rights conscious way. Thank you very much indeed. I apologize for taking so much time. Thank you, Ambassador. You remain within the allocated time, so congratulations for that. And I really would like to thank you for, you know, touching both on um, internal initiative within Fiji, but also your uh, leadership at the regional uh, levels, indeed highlighting uh, in particular the importance of uh, full community participation. So thank, thank you for that, Ambassador. So, uh, my third speaker, and uh, sir, it's really a pleasure to, to have you, is Mr. Alassane Sengore. He's the Secretary General of the Gambia Red Cross Society. So now we are moving to uh, West Africa. Having joined the Gambia Red Cross uh, in 1976 as a youth and field officer, Mr. Sengore has subsequently served in various international capacity with the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies and with the International Committee of the Red Cross, including as IFRC Permanent Observer to the United Nations and also the Director of Africa. So, Mr. Sengore, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for having me and uh, Excellencies and uh, their colleague uh, panelists. I would like to use this opportunity to to extend our sincere appreciation for being part of this process and to share a little experience, uh, both in terms of uh, the region, the Sahel context, but also uh, specifically to the Gambian context. Um, I think uh, uh, the two previous speakers and the ambassador of France made my, uh, my task a bit easier uh, by providing the uh, 
the, the contextual framework for uh, what I was going to talk about. Um, first and foremost, I think there are three factors that I would like to, uh, to, to highlight here as uh, the key uh, drivers. And one is, is the uh, economic, socioeconomic uh, conditions of the region, the Sahel, um, knowing that it's one of the most uh, you know, uh, uh, economically uh, not very strong economies in the, in the, in the continent, but also uh, in terms of the uh, environmental degradation. Um, this is a region that has faced a lot of uh, uh, challenges ranging from uh, droughts every uh, four or five years, but also uh, the fact that when you look at also uh, Lake Chad, which is uh, currently a big challenge uh, for, for the region. Um, when you look at the, the diagram in terms of the picture of uh, Lake Chad, it has been gradually disappearing over the years. And access to water and those whose livelihood were based on the Lake Chad, um, you know, have been threatened. And of course, uh, it has created a lot of problems. Uh, on the other hand, when you look at the, 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 the non-international armed conflict that is uh, happening in the, in the, in the Sahel, um, uh, particularly with regards to what is happening uh, in Nigeria, between Nigeria, Cameroon, and Chad, uh, and to some extent, and Niger, and, and Mali, and so on. I mean, this could be seen as political, but at the same time, uh, something that uh, is linked to what I said uh, earlier on in terms of the economies of these countries, but more so uh, the, the political environment uh, linking to what was happening in the Middle East uh, in the past with the fall of Gaddafi and, of course, the return of the, the Tuaregs in the, in, the, in the desert and then attacking and having access to to trying to have access to some of the resources in those countries. So that created a lot of problems. I mean, we've seen the, the humanitarian consequences of uh, the armed conflict, non-international armed conflict uh, with Boko Haram uh, and also in the Sahel. Um, in 2014, over 10,000 lives were lost, a lot of internal and cross-border displacements. Um, of course, the, that led to disruption of uh, uh, food production and livelihoods and the indiscriminate violence and sexual violence and, of course, uh, internal displacements that had happened. Now, when it comes to the socioeconomic uh, conditions of the region, um, we've also seen the uh, irregular migration uh, that has taken shape over the past years uh, with a lot of young people taking the back way through the Sahel, the Sahara Desert into, into Europe. And uh, I mean, these are some of the critical issues that are affecting the region. But what we see is basically it's stemming from the long years of drought in the Sahel uh, due to environmental degradation but also uh, some of the economic or the policies of the countries in terms of education, for example. If we take a country uh, or many of the countries in the sub-region, um, the issue of education, uh, people say, when you go to a certain grade, you are dropped out of school. I mean, it's not the making of the children. Very often, it's, it's the system that squeezes out uh, the, the kids, the children from, from school because the uh, the access to uh, higher education is limited. The number of spaces that are available for people to move to tertiary and uh, other, other sectors is limited. And there's very limited uh, access to vocational or other, other training. So that creates a lot of bottlenecks in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the migration. So kids start, uh, young people start migrating to look for greener pastures. Now, we are fortunate to have a, a demography that is uh, a greater percentage of the population in the sub-region are young people. And, and often people talk about uh, demographic dividend. But I, I, I always say that the demographic dividend can be a demographic deficit uh, if we don't properly manage uh, the, this whole economy and also the issues around uh, climate change and, and so on. Uh, and I think 
the, the, the Sendai framework uh, provides uh, an avenue for governments and other non-state actors to, 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 to deal with issues around climate change. Uh, but again, in terms of migration, in terms of uh, internal displacement, uh, either cross-border or internally, um, uh, the, the, the global compact on migration and the uh, global compact for refugees, I think creates a good framework. But I think the issue here is about uh, having to, the, the commitment that is needed in terms of mobilizing and getting this to, to move forward. Um, I think uh, for me, I would like to, uh, to, 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 to bring in some, some of the, the critical things that I think should be looked at. First and foremost, when it comes to issues around uh, human rights, uh, around, um, uh, uh, when it comes to around internal tensions or internal political problems, I think what we need to do is to be more aware in terms of uh, the early warning systems that have been talked about and that is being uh, pushed by the African Union and the ECOWAS. Uh, but I think the issue here, the gap here is that most of this early warning and all these other things are very much political and doesn't go down to, to the level where people can own the processes. I think the last speaker talked about that, which is very important. Whatever uh, has to be in place has to be driven by the, the people themselves. Um, the, including the issue of peace building and also the issue of peaceful coexistence. And I would like to extend a bit on that because uh, when it comes to cross-border uh, displacements, uh, the issue of uh, equitable support, both to the, to the host communities and the people who are displaced from other countries is very important. And this is where now we have to look at the issues around policies uh, or regional policies. Uh, for example, in the case of the Sahel, we have the ECOWAS that has the, the policy of free movement of people and goods. Uh, it's, it's very good, but often not very, very much practice or put into practice by many governments, and that needs to be needs to be looked. Then the, the other issue is all about uh, the, what the last speaker uh, said about access to land, uh, both for agriculture and for grazing. Um, we've seen uh, recently in the Gambia where we had challenges of uh, using agricultural land for commercial or housing, which is creating a problem. And this is this is uh, the same in many countries in the in the sub region, and that is something that needs to be addressed. Uh, access to water is also a challenge, um, and then of course. Uh, I think for me, what is important is really for policies um, to be implemented. When it comes to human rights, I think uh, uh, the uh, human rights approach, uh, I, might be, I might be wrong because I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a human rights um, <clears throat> a person. But all, all I know is that most of the human rights approaches are very much political and not really specifically pushing for people to understand their rights in terms of access to food, access to water and other things. So, so I think it's important to look at uh, both the, the applicability, but the knowledge that people should have in terms of uh, understanding their rights, both in their countries and across border when they move so that they can demand for it. We in the Red Cross have had some uh, projects that are dealing with migrants, both in our country, in the Gambia, supporting them to have access to water, to have access to health and to shelter and all these other things. And in other countries, in the Sahel as well, some of the national societies are also supporting uh, and providing those uh, same support to migrants and people who are displaced across uh, borders. So I think uh, I would end here uh, and uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Sengori, and, and indeed thank you for bringing the, the perspective from uh, Gambia and uh, the Sahel and uh, highlighting, you know, the combination of, of factors which basically uh, force people uh, to move uh, and that in, in that sense um, climate is, is one of them combined with uh, economic factors uh, and um, 
also um, uh, other factors, in particular conflict. So I think it's a very interesting case study of, um, of factors combined uh, by themselves and uh, basically forcing people to, to flee. Also very important to remark about the importance of, uh, and it per perfectly valid in the context of people forced to, to leave for climate related reason to address the need for both the people being displaced and uh, the host communities. So I think um, I will um, stop here. I will again encourage you to put your question in the, the, the chat box. I, I believe there are already uh, two or three questions. So now I will hand over to uh, my colleague, uh, Christian Wolf to walk through the second part. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much, Stefan, and, and thank you very much to um, to all the panelists for this for these really really interesting uh, remarks, which which I think will will serve us very well for the discussion. Uh, and as Stefan said, please please keep your questions coming, um, and we I'll try to direct them to the right uh, panelists or set of panelists. The first uh, question came from Camilla Bertoglio, uh, who has written a master's thesis on human mobility uh, due to climate change impacts, and says she got criticized by many professors because they thought her um, her approach was too deterministic. So her question is, um, and, and I thought um, I thought maybe we can we can start with Lauren for this. Um, how can we go further and create real and strong protection framework even without specific data? And then I think we could link this perhaps also with a bit of a reflection um, on uh, you know has have things advanced a bit in terms of accepting the reality of climate-induced migration and displacement and where do we stand on that today? I think it was really, really interested what, what Ambassador Khan had to say about that. But perhaps we can start with, with Lauren, if you have any thoughts on, on uh, promoting uh, frameworks in, in the absence of data or have we come, has this developed a bit in recent years in your view? Thanks, Christian. Um, I think that question is an excellent one and it's identified certainly one of the, the key gaps that we have in data and, the, and overall the difficulty linking uh, climate change as a, as a direct cause of migration. Um, but I think we know in general, and I think we know um, enough that, uh, that it will be a threat multiplier. So it's not just that slow onset events or that e like even sudden onset events at times um, directly contribute to my ability, but they can contribute to vulnerability as well. And we know that that leads to precarious migration. Um, and I think one of the benefits of human rights based approaches is we can take action in advance to advance uh, to address these risks. And um, that's why they're such a powerful tool. Um, and foremost, um, we can mitigate and reduce potential harm. And so I think that's something we need to focus on. Um, we can then also adapt um, and, and, and provide people safe pathways or allow them to stay in place. Um, and this ties into obligations, their legal obligations in the climate agreement. Um, so it's not just about proving that there's a specific number of people who are going to move. Um, it's not just about addressing displacement, but it's about making mobility part of the larger effort uh, for climate action. Um, and then for human rights, it's about addressing foreseeable risks. So we know that there's going to be risks to human rights. Um, we may not know the scope based on how much we're going to mitigate or adapt, um, but we do know that people are already struggling, like as Mr. Sanghor said, to, uh, to access resources that can contribute to vulnerability, um, and we can do something about that now. Um, so I think first we can address gaps in data. I do think we're getting better about knowing like certain climate change impact hotspots and about how that affects people, um, and then we can understand um, how that affects people's human rights. Um, and then importantly, I think it's also about what Ambassador Khan noted that human rights also is a way to frame or to get people involved in, in, in decisions that affect them. And that's crucial for understanding the risks uh, on the ground and then, and then also for making decisions that people ultimately um, can live a sustainable life. Um, so I think the important crucial thing for the way that I look at it is that we have the time to plan. Um, which these speakers have emphasized. We can put actions in place to offer legal pathways so it doesn't become future migration crises. 
Um, and we have the international frameworks and mechanisms to do this. We have legal obligations and climate agreements. We have human rights uh, uh, duties that speak to this. It's just a matter of coordinating these across different silos and it's a matter of prioritizing this and making sure that rights are more than a rhetorical response. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question a bit. Yes, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and, and, and let me perhaps go back to, to Ambassador Khan and, and frame it a different way. Um, what, you thought, what you said I thought was really interesting in terms of, you know, there's often at the global, at the policy level, there's this, this debate about, um, you know, to what extent do we have the right data? And then what you were saying seemed to indicate that for people in, in a lot of ways, um, there is perhaps too much, or there's been too much of a rush in, in global discussions about the fact that, you know, we need to address displacement uh, without really having asked in the first place, um, what, are the, what are the initial impacts? So for your perspective in the Pacific, what do you think is, is, the, um, is, the, is the view on data and lack of data? Is this being discussed or, or what can we learn from, from uh, the relocation um, plan, for example, that you discussed and how can that influence useful policy, especially at a regional level? Thank you very much. I think, um, you know, the Sendai framework was a real game changer, certainly for the Pacific, because for the first time here was an international policy document, which we were able to integrate into our own national disaster risk reduction policies, which actually changed the way we approached um, sudden onset disasters. And we then incorporated in this framework a process of community um, participation at a preparatory level. And it was the community that was providing the data, which is not always officially available. So the Sendai framework was excellent for providing better information, for ensuring better community participation. And because it's a language of resilience, it does not depend on a sudden disaster. It is a long ongoing policy framework process. So um, I think the Sendai framework really was an excellent way in which we approach not really knowing how uh, disasters um, and migration is affecting communities, how many people actually are moving. Uh, I think that that really is an example of how an international policy document can be integrated into national policy and national laws in order to create um, a scenario where you can have national laws and policies uh, which really integrate this, this knowledge that the community has, which governments may not always have. Great, thank you very much. Um, our next question I think would best be answered by Alison Senghor because it's about the Sahel. Uh, Miri Mapo is asking, or is, is talking about the problem of, of free movement in, in that part of the world, which has been a problem for a long time. Um, is, is there a way forward or how do you see, um, uh, Alison, how do you see this being discussed in the region in the context of climate change? Has this had an impact uh, on discussions? Are there any new solutions on the, on the horizon? Uh, uh, thank you very much. I think this is a very uh, important question I raised, also uh, a point around that, uh, and it relates to uh, first and foremost, when you look at uh, at continental level or sub-regional level where they come up with policies and uh, it's fine, it's accepted, but in terms of real implementation becomes a challenge. So uh, particularly in the, in, the Sahel, in the Sahel and in the Coas region, where many of the countries, uh, there is already free movement of people and goods and so on. But the applicability depends on the country. So I think this is where, and the reason why I was emphasizing the need for awareness, uh, for the for people to know what laws exist and their rights so that they can push for, for this. Because, I mean, it's fine to, uh, to sit in ECOWAS meeting and promulgate laws and all these other things, but it's another to implement. When you take ECOWAS, for example, the applicability of uh, free movement of people uh, differs 
uh, when you go to every country, they implement this differently. And this is something that it really is not acceptable. And that's why I emphasize, you can have the best laws, you can have the best agreements, but if the people are not aware and they don't take ownership and drive the process of uh, claiming for what belongs to them, their rights, uh, you will never get anywhere. So I think for me, uh, we have at one level the political uh, level, but also the local level where people should own these things and push for their rights and then get what they want. Thank you. I don't know whether that answers the question, but I think that's the only way forward. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for those reflections. Uh, we have a number of questions now which I'll try to, to group together that have to do with with human rights frameworks and, and how they are best applied in this context and, and by specific governments. So uh, perhaps I'll go back to Lauren for this. Um, questions around um, A, how to best identify climate-induced migrants? Um, are there any accepted standards for this? Um, in, and then related to that, the question, what do we do with countries where human rights uh, uh, abuses are rampant and there's a number of, of issues to be dealt with as you also mentioned a bit in your in your presentation how do we make sure that you know climate as an issue is is not ignored in those contexts and perhaps finally um are there differences in in the ways in which democratic and and autocratic regimes deal with this is it you know what can we learn from attempts to promote democracy in relation to human rights of climate-induced uh, migrants. Uh, if you have, uh, if you want to take a stab at that uh, bag of questions, I'd be very grateful. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, those are some excellent and tough questions. Um, I think on the latter, uh, on the democratic and autocratic countries, I will say I'm not an expert in global politics or specifically in certain national politics, um, but uh, the way that leadership sees the issue of climate change and how people see the issue of climate change, I think, is one of the most determining factors. Um, you can see, even in my own country that's democratic, that uh, the way that we see climate change is, is affecting our participation in international frameworks um, and how we address the problem or don't. Um, in terms of countries that where human rights abuses are al already problematic and rampant, that's, that's a big issue. Um, and I think that ties into capacity as well as to developing these kinds of regional and international approaches to frameworks. Um, so if there's a willingness in countries um, to not only fulfill their obligations, but to, to, co to coordinate in, in these, um, that will be a solution going forward. We can't just then on the other side, leave communities and people alone in addressing climate change, or we're gonna see a great deal more of human suffering. Um, and then as a lawyer, um, I often focus on the legal obligations. And we have, uh, you know, states that have the capacity have very clear legal obligations to not only assist and cooperate in human rights, but also in climate agreements to provide um, fi finance and techni technical support in, for example, adaptation um, and in efforts to address Climate, uh, climate change and to plan for it. Um, and, and those will be key, I think, um, provided that there is both the, the willingness in leadership and also, um, as was just identified, that there are the access um, and will of people to use the tools of human rights and to demand this. Um, but again, I am not an expert in, in how politics work on the ground. It's certainly a key part of it. I'm a lawyer, so I'm focusing on the legal obligations. Yeah, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, let me jump to another question we got from, from Adriana Pumala uh, from Caritas Internationalis. Uh, again, to, to bring in Ambassador Khan, um, reflect a little bit on the, on the theme of climate-induced displacement, which was quite, quite prominent at COP23. Um, how have you seen this evolve since then? Um, we're, you know, this year we will not have a COP, it's been postponed to next year. Um, do you see these discussions having progressed since then or and what do you think can be done to make sure this is higher on the agenda going forward in that process? So there's been extraordinary movement um, with the task force on displacement which of course is part of the Warsaw uh, mechanism and um, what was originally seen again as a difficult conversation in the climate 
uh, negotiations because it is so closely connected to loss and damage has become a conversation which is much more palatable much easier for people to have and i think really uh, hats off to the task force on displacement which incidentally has this cross um, regional and cross institutional representation so for instance the iom is on that uh, task force so i think extraordinary movement there secondly i see that there is a narrowing of the gap in the climate negotiations there has always been resistance to um, hearing people's voices in the climate negotiations and of course the rationale behind that is you didn't sign the paris agreement you didn't sign the convention. So please, can you just speak through your governments? But you know, the voices of the people worldwide have become more and more strident. And I'm hearing the voices of children very loudly, because after all, this planet is theirs eventually. So I, I think that with the um, introduction of the platform um, for indigenous people, um, the gender action plan, for instance, and the greater voices of children in the climate negotiations and in the events surrounding them have really seen extraordinary progress in the narrowing of this gap between negotiations and people. So I do see progress and I do see it specifically uh, on displacement. I also see as a direct result of the work at UNFCCC and the task force, many more programs uh, for the IOM, for instance. Just this morning, I was at a briefing at the IOM, which explained all the work that it's doing on climate change migration. And it's extraordinary how much they've done. And the partnership that the IOM has with OHCHR, for instance, and the Platform on Disaster Displacement in the Pacific. So extraordinary work, much more commitment, more resources, much more conversation. I think really, I would say very positive progress. But the important thing is to take people with you in these conversations. Yes, thank you very much. If I can stay with you just for a moment and try to combine a little bit because there's a question that relates to that, which is more on, um, on other frameworks. So we have the UNFCCC framework, we have the work task force, but we also now have the two, two global compacts. And many people would agree that the, the compact on migration perhaps is the more comprehensive one in terms of trying to give guidance to states on this topic. Um, how do you see the usefulness of that instrument? Has it helped you in approaching this topic with states and other stakeholders? And then what do you see for the future there? Well, yes, it has. I mean, we know that not every country in the world supports the Global Compact. Um, and many which did originally have pulled out. But as far as the, um, the significance of the Global Compact on Migration has been on disaster displacement, I would say that there is overwhelming support around the world for that context. And also the Global Compact has been a very good um, launching pad, if you like, for the possibility of a regional framework in the Pacific for cross-border displacement on the basis of dignity and human rights. And I think that's really the focus. You know, no more camps, no more movement of people without planning, no more disregard for whether children are going to school or whether there's adequate housing or whether people are moving to better conditions than they had previously. And I think those are the conversations that the Global Compact has successfully begun in the Pacific and has led to this really important conversation of whether we're ready for a regional framework. The rest of the world will no doubt work towards some sort of international agreement in due course. But the Pacific can't wait for that. This problem is at our doorstep. And so therefore conversations already have begun in the Pacific about a regional framework for displacement, cross-border, which the people are part of. And I think as I've said, and I've continuously said, if the people are not part of this, it's not gonna work. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions um, that I'll, I'll try to combine uh, maybe for, for Alassan again, because they're reflecting on the, on the situation in Africa. Um, one is, is from Albert Machika about the, you know, how do you promote um, dignified and rights-based human mobility against a background that is often very fragile and in which sustainability and a number of other policy areas is a problem. And, and combined with that, a question from Belinda Hernandez, who's from Zimbabwe originally, um, about balancing uh, what she refers to as traditional views of what human rights mean uh, and when they clash with culture. 
Um, so, you know, in other words, when there are a lot of times, nothing seems to change for the poorest and most marginalized, even when they have a good education. And so uh, there's no investment and no, no well-paying jobs. And, you know, sanitation is a problem, water and food is a problem, as you also mentioned. How do you, perhaps you can talk a bit about the Red Cross as an organization, how do you place that topic in terms of prioritizing it and trying to make progress um, in your specific uh, context? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, very tough questions because it's very much, some of it uh, are related to the context. Uh, and uh, fortunately for me, I spent uh, a number of years in Zimbabwe, so uh, I might try to, to respond. But all I can say is uh, going back to what I said earlier on in terms of uh, the ownership of the people. Um, if we institutions like Red Cross, what we do is we are a community based because we have our members right in the community. So whatever uh, rights or information or capacities that needs to be built in terms of understanding some of the laws and uh, some of the things, the rights that they have, um, we do that with the communities. Uh, the bottom-up approach is more important. The policies can be made and the laws can be there, but uh, if the people don't understand and they don't demand for it, they don't ask for it, uh, it doesn't happen. And the same thing goes for water, access to water. I think in many countries, a lot of people, especially in the rural communities, still believe that uh, the water is not their right. Uh, they believe that this is something that has to be there. Uh, so they struggle for it. And I can give an example in the context of the Gambia and COVID, uh, when uh, some of our villages uh, along the border with Senegal uh, did not have access to water. So they were dependent on crossing the border into villages in Senegal to get water. But when the lockdown happened and the borders were closed, they had problems of access to water. So we had to create, uh, start uh, providing boreholes for them to have water. All these years, they could not raise their voice to say that this is their rights. So it goes back to the issue of people uh, knowing what their rights are and owning processes to demand for those things. Now, the issue of balancing between uh, human rights and all this and the culture, I think uh, it's uh, also depends on uh, what the practices and the traditions are, because there are some traditional practices for cultures that are very good. Uh, and I think when you look at human rights and all these things, it's also there are certain things that are also in our culture. So you, it's, it depends on the individual and the context to really see how you balance that uh, to, to, to get those things, uh, people to understand. So very difficult question. So I can only give you my opinion on that. But I think it's all boils down to getting the people to know their rights and demand for it and exercise their rights uh, at any given time. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions now related a bit to, to strategy. One from Laura uh, Morrill on um, on, uh, and maybe I can, I can give this to Lauren to think about. Um, is there a strategy to link up frameworks that address climate change and the objectives of the, the migration compact in particular to promoting migrants' access to services, both in countries of origin and destination? Um, you talked earlier about the fact that, uh, you know, slow onset events are a bit easier in the sense that they're easier to plan for. Um, so what, what amount of thinking has there been or should there be from your perspective in terms of making sure that uh, those who will be uh, forced to move down the line will have access to services? Is there, has that been part of any, any particular um, solutions that you're looking at? Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, that is a, that's a difficult question as well. Um, and so in terms of linking institutions or efforts right now, I think that there are definitely, and we've identified things like the task force on displacement um, and the climate change regime. I think once we get actors at an international level uh, involved in these different frameworks, that keeps consistency across international dialogue. And I'm mo my research mostly focuses on international mechanisms. So I'm afraid I don't know as much about regional mechanisms, but I do know, um, for example, that PDD is doing excellent work working with um, states in the Pacific um, and other regions to have regional and coordinated efforts um, 
to, to, um, to provide um, not only resources for planning, but then also to take the planning, those planning uh, mechanisms in, and apply them on the ground um, and to uh, consult more locally and work from the bottom up. So I think that we need an approach that both crosses these silos um, with the GCM, with um, the Sendai framework, with um, the even the sustainable development goals and the, and the UNFCCC, um, and then also that works from the bottom up, um, as cliche as that might sound. Um, but um, I also think that at the same time, in terms of getting access to um, resources and then free, free mobility that we do have the best practices in place at a national level and we need to learn from those. Um, there are free movement agreements, there are people that are taking up the cause for climate litigation. Um, most importantly, I think especially during this time of COVID, I think we need to keep the discourse up on climate change and why it's important and what, why it's the problem, I think, of, of, of our time and for future generations. Um, so I think tangentially answered that question, um, but um, if there's follow-up to help me further guide that, that would be great. Yeah, no, th thank you. Thank you for that. Maybe we'll return to that in the in the closing round. Um, I have a, a big sort of moral question now, which I, I think is very pertinent in the Pacific in particular, so perhaps we could ask Ambassador Khan to come, come back in on this, um, from Hallie Lucas, who's asking, um, you know, how do we deal with this problem of uh, of scenarios? Um, what what climate scenarios are being planned for? Um, and, and she highlights the issue that you know there's an amount of moral hazard inherent in preparing for a world in which temperatures will rise by more than two degrees. Um, how do you balance that with the human rights based approach and the need to still motivate decision makers to engage in mitigation? Um, at the same time, the need to be to be prepared for uh, potentially disastrous events. And it seemed to me, like from what you were saying earlier, Ambassador, that this is something that that has been very deeply discussed in the Pacific. So, how do you how do you uh, witness that being being uh, brought out in the dialogues there? I think that's a very good question uh, because the Pacific Islands have been central to the climate negotiations. They were very vocal in, in Paris. Um, and what they were saying is, if you don't reduce emissions now, we will lose our homes. And that is a terrible scenario for us. And so in a way, if the Pacific Islanders are starting to talk about losing their homes, it's almost an admission of failure uh, in the world, um, belief in the world, and it is a moral dilemma. On the other hand, we are already moving our people from the coastal areas to higher land. And what do you do if you live on an island which has no higher land? Because it's a coral atoll. And so here we have a moral dilemma in a way. Do we have a conversation about moving when would we would rather the world reduced emissions drastically so that we wouldn't have to move? And I think the answer is, God forbid that we have to move. We hope very much that we will not have to move. But in the worst case scenario, if we do have to move some of our people, and in fact, we already are, then we are ready and we will do it in a dignified and orderly manner. We will do it with a control over the destinies of our people by ensuring that our people are central to this decision. And we will do it irrespective of what the rest of the world is doing. This is the Pacific taking control over the destiny of its own jurisdictions. And it's a very important conversation. I think the best way to frame it is, we will not move, we do not want to move, but if we do have to, then we will do it in a way which is consistent with the Pacific way of life, which is based on dignity and, in, and is based on uh, community strength and resilience. I think this is the best way to approach it. And that is certainly the way uh, that I see Pacific Islands approaching the issue at present. No, thank you very much for that. Uh, and, and again, this is, this is something I think we'll have to continue to, to struggle with um, as we discuss this. So it's, it's really good to hear um, how the discussions are going on um, at ground level on this. Um, I have a, a very specific question to Lauren um, from Atle Solberg at the PDD regarding the recent um, decision of the Human Rights Committee in the case of uh, Teotia versus New Zealand, um, 
and uh, Lauren, perhaps you can, you can summarize it for, for those of us who, who may not be fresh in our minds. Um, it, it was about responsibility of, of states, uh, third states, to those uh, displaced by the effects of climate change. Um, do you see that as a step in the right direction um, in the way that human rights can be can be used for addressing protection gaps in, in cross-border displacement, or, or how do you see the significance of that? Hi, yeah, thanks, Atlee. That's a really good question. Um, and just to give a bit of background, so uh, Mr. Tere uh he sought like um, refugee status or, or complementary status. So basically saying his life was at risk if he stayed in Kiribati um, and had made it to New Zealand and wanted to, wanted to stay in New Zealand. And New Zealand ultimately decided that he needed to be removed back to his country because his life was not at gra grave enough risk. Um, the Human Rights Committee this year um, issued a decision, which um, for, for those of you who don't know, Human Rights Committee decisions are um, not legally binding, but they're very influential about the way law goes. Um, and essentially said that it, it upheld New Zealand's decision, but it did, I think, provide some things that are helpful for the human rights framework and some things that concern me. Um, first, I think non refoulement in general, um, which is kind of based on individual decisions, um, well, it is based on individual decisions, is very backward looking. So it, you have to already cross into a border or be at, at grave risk. Um, but until this decision was made, there hadn't been uh, any kind of legal body that had said, um, this is an option for people in the future. So I think importantly, it said, this is an option for people in the future that states will have obligations to let people into their border because, or, or to let people in or let them stay because of their risks that, at home from climate change that will put their life at risk. Um, so in the future, this is a legal option for people on the move. Um, I think what concerned me about the decision is that the committee also noted that um, Kiribati is taking steps right now to adapt, for example, and that even though, as uh, Ambassador Khan has identified, there's this great risk and people are gonna have to move, um, that that risk is not imminent enough right now. So it's just not a big enough threat to allow people to stay in other countries. And that troubles me a bit because um, if, the risk is not so great right now in these countries, when is it gonna be great enough? And once it reaches that threshold, we're gonna have people in crisis, I think. So we need to come up with human rights-based solutions that are more proactive and anticipatory and not just rely on non refoulement especially given that the Human Rights Committee has said um, that, that states can figure this out politically. They also said that in the decision or that they can adapt and, and so we can figure things out in the future. So it's kind of deferred things to the future rather than making a solution right now. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that. Um, I have one last question and then maybe we'll do, we'll do a, a roundup. Um, and that's um, um, about, the, about ownership, uh, people's ownership of these processes. We've heard already, I think, a very good example from, from the Pacific about how to involve communities in, in, in these discussions and making decisions about their own future. Um, and so the question is on both national or regional levels in your ge geographic areas of expertise, um, what examples, is, are there any good practices concerning people's ownership? And I thought maybe uh, Alassane could come in on this and, and complement what we've already heard from the Pacific. Uh, in the Sahel or, or in Gambia particularly, are there any practices that you can speak of where, you know, people are debating uh, these topics and are involved uh, in, in a meaningful way? Or if not, what do you think should be undertaken to ensure that there is more ownership of people among these discussions going forward? Thank, thank you very much. Very, very fundamental question. I think uh, uh, often people talk about ownership, but uh, it starts by uh, from the uh, initial stages when you're discussing about uh, the people. They should be sitting around to be part of the process, uh, both from the planning or even in terms of uh, policy uh, formulation. Uh, we, we, we've seen that in Africa as a, as a challenge where people sit in parliaments or in other government offices and decide for the people. 
so I think the best approach is really to to engage the people. So they should go back to their people and uh, engage them before coming to the drawing board so that they have an input from the beginning. Um, whether there are examples of that, I think we at the Red Cross, that's what uh, we try to do because uh, we are global, national, but we are at uh, local as well, uh, where we have our volunteers at the core. Uh, they sit in the boards, they sit in the decision making, around the decision making table to decide on uh, on the policies, but also on uh, the projects and programs that affect them. So I think this is uh, how we work in the Red Cross across the, the, the continent uh, in many instances. And that's why we always bring um, in the, 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 the the issues that are coming from the community. So I think that would be the best approach uh, rather than, so community and whether there is a good practice, that's the practice that I can share from my experience. And this is happening across the continent uh, in terms of Red Cross. And I think it's a good practice that uh, people can emulate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I now would like to give all, all three of the panelists uh, an opportunity for very brief last remarks before I hand it over to my colleagues for closing. So if you have, uh, you know, in terms of main takeaways or perhaps advice to the participants in terms of uh, where to focus their energies, what is, what is the most important priority going forward um, to ensure that we can make progress on this topic uh, in the next few months and years? Let me perhaps start with, uh, with Lauren and then we go through the rest of the panelists. Lauren. Sure. Um... And I know I might sound repetitive, but I think for me, the, the key takeaway or um, focus is on acting now. We have opportunities to act now. Um, we can plan. We know some of the risks. We may not know all of them. Um, and we have these institutional mechanisms and frameworks in place at all levels um, to start taking action. Um, and, and so I think the fact that we have, we can foresee that this is a problem in the future, that it's not just like COVID that comes up suddenly, um, gives us an opportunity to really reduce or mitigate um, the human suffering that will happen if we don't do something now. Um, so to use the tools at our disposable, disabo sorry, disposal, um, to emphasize the risks to human rights and then act on those and not wait until people are in mass facing human rights abuses or violations. Um, so that's my main takeaway. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Khan, can I ask you to share some final, final words? Thank you very much. Um, I think, like Lauren, I would also say it's really important to act now in order that um, our future actions are planned, are orderly, and based on human dignity. I think this is important. But I would also say that um, moves towards having these discussions, certainly in the Pacific, are encouraging and should be uh, further encouraged so that uh, the communities in the Pacific can now see this as uh, an inclusive and participatory conversation. And thirdly, I would say that this is a process which does not necessarily have to be a, based on the language of disempowerment. This is also about the language of empowerment, of communities taking the forefront, and of voices which have not been heard before being heard in this process. So I think that would be my key takeaway, that this is a, not necessarily a disempowering process, it's a transformative process. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's a very, very uh, important point and one that can sometimes be forgotten when we're looking at human rights frameworks and, and, and doing advocacy globally on this. So thanks for reminding us. Um, Alassane. Thank you. For last words, please. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, I, for me, I think what is important is I'm going back to the to what I said earlier on in terms of uh, awareness, uh, people being part of the processes and right from the beginning uh, in terms of the formulation to understanding what it means and what their rights are. Uh, but at the same time, uh, looking at all these processes. Uh, particularly the uh, global compacts, uh, what does it really mean in practice? And then engaging uh, people to be part of the process. I think we can sit in meetings and webinars and all these things, but the 
most important is to engage the people uh, to, to understand and to know what it means for them so that they can be part of the process. That it's only then that we can see uh, improvement in terms of respect for human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize we didn't get to all the questions and um, we tried to do manage as best as we as we could. Um, and but thank you all for your active participation. I would now like to hand over to my colleague Amparo Alonso, who's the head of advocacy and campaign for Caritas Internationalis, um, for our closing remarks. Amparo, go ahead. Amparo, can you hear us? Are you there? Ah, okay. Can I um, can I ask uh, the organizers to quickly Hello? enable? Hello, Christian. Ah, there you are. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I I didn't Excellent. see. No, please go ahead now that you can now that we can hear you, please. Hello. Um Afrin, is it possible to check? I think you're muted, uh, Amparo. Can you can you check your uh, settings? Because you're on mute at the moment. Afrin, is there something we can do to check from, from your end about the, um, about the technical setup? Okay, Amparo says she can hear us. In which case, um, yeah, we're getting some guidance from PDD. And uh, apologies to our participants if you could just hang hang with us for a minute. We should be able to work this out because we did, of course, all the regular all the tests in advance and everything worked. But <laughs> this is how things turn out sometimes in the age of remote conferencing. Hello, Christian. Hello. Yes, you're back. Hello, can yes. you hear me now? Excellent. Please go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. We can hear Hello. you. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Hello? Joder, ¿qué pasa? Yes, 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 we can hear you. We oh, can hear you, Amparo. My Please goodness. go ahead. <laughs> oh, even, I, probably I also have a video here. There oh, you go, excellent. Yes, sorry, right. sorry. Oh. Well, we're very glad, we're very glad to have you. No worries, no worries. 
Please go ahead. Sweat, sweating. <laughs> so thank you very much to all the participants for on, on this important topic, um, cross-border human mobility and human rights in the context of disasters, climate change, and environmental degradation. First of all, thanks to the panelists, Ambassador Francois Rivasso, even if he had to, to leave the, the, the webinar before. Uh, Lauren, thank you very much for, for this important study. And the ambassador, uh, Shamin Khan, the permanent representative of Fiji. This webinar in, indeed uh, aimed to, to provide a space to, to discuss uh, in a deeper way uh, the, the slow onset disasters and the climate change, but also to provide some recommendations. And I think after this interesting uh, discussion, um, we could just highlight some of the on today, bearing in mind that it's important because people forcibly displaced across borders in the context of climate change and disasters, and disasters suffer from, from a protection gap. Uh, we all have agreed during today's webinar that human rights-based approach is critical and must be ensured while addressing the protection challenges for those at risk of displacement or displaced across borders in the context of climate change and disasters. We have mentioned today several international processes, policy frameworks, and could be and might be a powerful source of protection, but we have, we have also seen how important is the implementation of those uh, international frameworks. We have mentioned, for example, the Human Rights Council resolution. We have mentioned Paris, uh, Paris Agreement by the ambassador. On, uh, on the importance of leave no one behind, not to leave no one behind. So that's key, the Agenda 2030, one of the Agenda 2030 principles. The UN Secretary General, in fact, also reminded us that the Global Compact on Migration, especially that we discussed today, the both Global Compacts, also mentioning the Global Compact on Refugees, but especially the Global Compact for Migration, aim to be a robust cooperative framework for protecting migrants uh, in vulnerable situations. How, however, we have also seen that how important uh, will be the implementation phase, even in this time uh, when, as for example, Caritas International is accompany uh, many Caritas in the world, the whole confederation in 200 countries, we see now that COVID pandemic uh, presents an additional challenge to this implementation phase but it still is needed, it's important to, to do it. And as the different panelists mentioned at the end, the importance to act now. The ambassador of France also had liked this point. It is imperative that the international community come together among states, UN, civil society organizations to discuss what human rights protection in the context of disasters and climate change means in practice and ensure the effective implementation and firm political commitment, partnership among states, and as mentioned also by um, Sheng Shengore, sorry, Shengore the, the importance of the ownership at the local level, very important. And it was mentioned several times Another recommendation for states and civil society to adopt a human rights-based approach means also to strengthen protection of affected communities before, during, and after the disaster displacement. After the movement, human rights law should inform actions to ensure assistance and protection, particularly for those in vulnerable situations. We spoke and we mentioned several times the need to ensure access to services. We mentioned several of them, health, water, the problem of water mentioned by Mr. Sengore. And meaningful and informed participation of affected people and access to justice, remedies and solutions. This was also uh, strongly highlighted in the report presented by Lauren important, very important, also mentioned by Ambassador Khan, uh, Shamin Khan on becoming agents of decision makers, the importance of this role at the local level, to be in mind the ownership at the local level, the drivers of their own development. 
A recommendation also that we could have liked during this discussion is to apply human rights considerations to admit disasters affected foreigners, including policy instruments and actions listed in the Global Compact on Migration Objective 5 in situations of disasters, adverse effect of climate change and environmental de degradation. And then also as uh, the co-organizers of this event, we think that it's also important to implement the toolbox approach outlined in the, in the nascent initiative agenda for the protection of cross-border disaster displaced people in line with the Global Compact for Migration, the Paris Agreement and the Sandai Framework. Finally, also a call to the UN agencies, to UNSCR, to IOM. We acknowledge that, for example, UNSCR has appointed a special advisor on climate change, which shows clear commitment and prioritization of this issue. We do hope that we can advance in the discussion to ensure effective protection of those displaced by climate change and disaster. So uh, with that, I would like to, to close this webinar reminding the last words of the panelists and the last takeaways of the panelists today. We need to act now. We need to create awareness about human rights at the local level. We need to reinforce the local level participation. We need to be in mind what is happening at the local level when taking decisions on the international level. And we need to translate those international commitments to the local level. With this, I thank all of you for your participation and I give again the floor to Christian for final closing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amparo. Um, and uh, thanks again also from, from our side, from Act Alliance, uh, to, to our co-organizers, to uh, the, the great array of, of speakers that we had, and uh, to all of you for logging on today and being part of this discussion with us. Um, as PDD colleagues mentioned initially, there will be a recording of this that will be made available to those who registered. So uh, we look forward to keeping in touch with you and, uh, and working, continuing to work together on this important topic. Thanks again for joining and uh, have a good uh, rest of the day wherever you are. Bye.